Hello and welcome to another Looney Tunes review video. If you are new to the channel, make sure you subscribe to follow my journey to review all 1000 classic Looney Tunes shorts and give this video a like as well. So this is a review for Falling Hair, released in 1943. It's the 414th in a series and is directed by Bob Clampett. You can find this on the Looney Tunes Gold Collection Volume 3 DVD set, on the Platinum Collection Volume 3 Blu-ray set, and it's also in the public domain, so once this review is over, I'll even have the short playing for you at the very end. So in case you haven't seen this one, and again, you can see the short at the end, but I'll just keep things consistent. So Bugs is at an airfield for some reason where he's reading Victory Through Hair Power, and that's something I'll get into very shortly, where he encounters a gremlin, and for the rest of the short, it's pretty much the gremlin tormenting bugs, and is, is one of Bob Clampett's absolute best cartoons he's ever made, at least in my opinion. First up, you're going to see uh, the highlights of the audio commentary I did with my good friend Blue Genocide, who also helped edit this review. The full thing's still up on YouTube, because again, this is in the public domain, but I thought I'd put it here for consistency's sake. And then you hear some new information from me, and again, you can watch the short as well. So, without further ado, let's get into it. See a funny joke here about censored, about the top sergeant right there. Uh, Bill Malen is animated on this short. He was also the voice of Snoopy in Peanuts. So he had a very interesting career. But with me today is my fellow gremlin, Blue Genocide. Say hi. Hi, guys. No. Uh, <laughs> so here's a classic, which... Plenty of you would have watched, I'm um, surely, on some sort of a uh, uh, public domain thing. And here's a beautiful, thats I'm pretty sure that's Bobby Kimson right there. I'm pretty sure of it. I mean, that's just beautiful pose. Reading Victory oh, yeah. Through Hair Power, which is based off Victory Through Air Power, which was a book that, uh, that Disney actually adapted as a feature-length movie. Released, I think, in 1944, I think. And in the film, actually estimated that the war would probably continue into like 1948 and all that sort of stuff. Which so it's, it's a fascinating time capsule. Oh, uh, Mick Kimson around this period was like the king. I gotta be honest, I'm not a big, big fan of his later, uh, I guess, chubbier, thuggier bugs, the more aggressive bugs. But I am a big fan of his bugs model from around this period. Speaking of models, I just love this gremlin design. Just. Like, I, I always thought when I was little, and that might be just due to the quality of the public domain prints, I thought that we had bananas sticking out on each side. I don't know why, <laughs> but now I realize it's actually airplane wings. But I, I thought there were bananas. We, yeah. We're probably not, not going to be on any more commentaries anymore. You're thinking that's, a, that's just a ridiculous <laughs> comment outrage. Well, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure most of the public domain prints I've seen have made him, like, look brown. We don't live in that period anymore. We have this beautiful HD restoration. It, it looks phenomenal. Um, mm. I'm not a big fan of I've, these cartoons where Bugs kind of uncharacteristically becomes the, the person the that's being antagonized. Hey, mm. But well, I think this one is, a, uh, in my opinion, this is a way, better way to do it than uh, the Cecil Turtle cartoons we've seen on the channel. I've already pointed out that I prefer uh, Rabbit Transit over those two, but this is a really good way to do it if you're going to do it. Mm, I just like exactly. there to be a little bit of back and back and forth but wow it's a nice, nice i think that was um i i think this has just got some of the best animation in a lot of the clampet cartoons you know it's just I mean, look at that well, clampet, just, you know, clampet the had some of the clampet had some of the best animators on the team at the at, at warner brothers of this period or the Schlesinger mm. studio i should say the gremlin idea actually would also be revisited later on i mean not this particular gremlin but just a different thing that Clamber would do, you know, with the gremlins from the Kremlin, you know, which is another cartoon I'm really looking forward to, to seeing. Oh, I it, thought you it, were it also has say, one of the best animations of Hitler I've ever seen. <laughs> I was going to say, are you, I, the, the idea of a gremlin was done again in 1984, but we have to reference well, that no, movie, well, right? <laughs> of course. You know, which of course featured Chuck Jones, which, you know, we could, we could, we could play that game all day pretty much. But the interesting thing about the gremlin idea, uh, it, it was Disney was going to do something with it, but all that ended up happening as far as I'm aware is that uh, a storybook ended up being made and that was it. Right. There was, so, there was going to be a movie, right? A short film or a, yeah. a movie. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. 
This is a great exactly. gag. I love the shot when Bugs like just like freaks out like that, and then he <laughs> turns in, turns into a yeah jackass. With the the John Kane and Bill, Bill Melendez commentary, I actually do encourage people to listen to it, which I I get it. It might be annoying to have to listen to you know that guy. But what what Bill Melendez ends up mentioning is quite interesting about working with. Clampett as a director versus working with McKimson as a director, which he did later on before he left for um, UPA. And he basically says it's working for an animator as, as a as who's sorry, a director who's also an animator is not exactly fun because they always try and correct your work. Whereas he felt that Clampett was, you know, sure he animated, but he wasn't a good animator, but he was a great director. So it's, I encourage you after this. Yeah, definitely give it a listen if you can and try and put up with John Kay. But it's actually a solid commentary, though. But the ending gag, and sorry to sport for the few of you who haven't seen it, it's, of course, a war-related reference where, you know, you would have, like, a ration card where certain letters allow you to have a certain amount of, you know, gasoline and, and all that. But it's one of, those, one of those things where if you're not familiar with wartime references like that, it'll definitely go over your head. But does it ruin the cartoon? No. No. Incredible, ain't it? Incredible, ain't it? <laughs> uh, this is Clamper doing his version of what um, Tex uh, did a few times where he'll just push things to the extreme where, oh, know, yeah. especially with that fall at the end. And then Frizz basically took this uh, car- cartoon's concept for a later Yosemite Sam cartoon, except yeah. Bugs was antagonizing Sam in that one. I just wanted to elaborate further about victory through air power which is parody here as Victory Through Hair Power. And that was a book by Alexander P. D. Seversky, and that was released in 1942, and that explained his theories of aviation, which ended up being useful to US strategies in World War II. Because unlike World War I, so World War I was mainly a ground-fought war involving trenches, and that introduced tanks to the mix. Poorly made tanks, yes, at first, but... And I am very much simplifying things here, believe me, but it was basically a ground fought war. But by the time World War II happened, you'd have airplane technology reaching a point where they would be used in warfare. And so through this book, Alexander outlined his theories on what the government should be doing in terms of aviation strategy. And as a result, how wars were fought was changed yet again. Simplified, yes, but that's essentially the major difference between the two wars. And Disney himself would actually adapt the book into a feature-length, partially animated film. And the author himself is there explaining the parts of his book and going into detail, and that apparently proved to be very influential in the war effort as well. I like how the first minute is just one really long pan, but it it sets up the short very nicely, and people at the time, because this is well and truly in World War II, they would have felt very patriotic watching it and seeing all these beautiful planes ready for the war effort to win the good fight and we end up with bugs sitting on a bomb called the blockbuster and that was one of the names given to the largest conventional bombs that was used by the royal air force so we soon see the gremlin and part of that actually comes from the book called the gremlins and that was written by roald dahl and if the name's familiar think charlie and chocolate factory the bfg and matilda This was actually his first children's book, and part of it was about his own experience as an RAF pilot in World War II. It involved a gremlin trying to destroy this plane, but the pilot in the book convinces the gremlin that they should join forces and go after Hitler together. I personally haven't read it. If you guys have, let me know in the comments if you want to elaborate further on that. And it was going to be adapted by Disney, but Disney couldn't make it work for various reasons, and that includes whether as a feature film or as a short. And even before then, the term gremlins was used by the RAF to explain when things in the plane broke down. Oh, it broke down due to the gremlins. So it was just a term that was used at the time. But you can imagine once the war ended, there would be no reason really to revisit this idea for a shorter feature because, well, Hitler by that point had committed suicide and the war was over. I do like when we see this gremlin for the first time, the first thing he's doing is just hitting the front of the bomb. He's just there doing that for no reason whatsoever. Just so bizarre. And when Bugs is talking to this gremlin, I just love the look of amazement on Bugs' face where he's like, yeah? And he's just absolutely amazed. In this one, 
again, they're still kind of figuring out bugs. It took them actually quite a few years before they really solidified who Bugs was, and even then there were still slight differences between the crews, but they more or less had the character down, and here, this is Clamper being Clampity, he just puts his own little uh, spin on it, and in this case, Bugs is pretty naive and quite gullible at times, where he's about to hit this bomb and he's like, what am I doing? And there's just tons of build-up to that particular moment, so you'll find in this short, Clamper does play a lot with time, and I think it works really well in that regard. And then I love the animation, and you're going to hear that a lot, by the way. And you've already heard that a lot in the commentary. The animation is superb in this short, whether it's with Kimson or Melendez or some of the other animators. It's just an incredible tour de force. You can pretty much freeze frame this entire short and you'd still be entertained because of how wild and wacky a lot of it is. So he breaks the fourth wall and asks the audience if it was a gremlin. I do like that touch because, again, for those a lot younger, these were shown in actual theatres with a theatre full of people. So you can imagine the effect on this big screen, you see Bugs dressing you as part of the audience. It's fantastic. So the gremlin says, well, it ain't Vendel Vilke. And that's a reference to the 1940 Republican nominee for president, Wendell Wilkie. Apparently there was more to it involving some sort of uh, Scandinavian type voice, Vendel Vilke, something like that, but I don't know the full details. So if you know the full details as to why he said Vendel Vilke, let me know in the comments below. Then we see a reference to the movie of Mice and Men, which starred Lon Chaney Jr., who played the role of a dim-witted character alongside Berridge's Meredith. And if you check out my review for Hoppy Go Lucky, I'll go into much more detail about that. But that's the whole, which way did he go, George? That comes from that movie. And then Bugs talks like Billy Gray's radio character Matilda on the Abbott Costello show. So whenever you hear, I'm only three and a half years old, that's where that comes from. And immediately we hear another radio reference, the whole, I like him, he's silly. If you ever hear that, that's from Wally Ma, who played the nasally voice Wilbur on Tommy Riggs and Betty Lou. So it's a lot of radio references. And it would be no different if they made Looney Tunes today and they referenced some kind of a you know, current pop culture reference, because a lot of these didn't actually come from Looney Tunes. A lot of this stuff was actually originated from the radio, which blew my mind, because a lot of this stuff I thought came from Looney Tunes, but no, a lot of it comes from the radio or movies. But I gotta say, rewatching this short for this updated review, it's really quite violent. You know, I love the animation of Bugs being attacked, and he's really put through the ringer in this one. It's Absolutely incredible. And another thing I noticed is how the gremlin was somehow able to turn on the plane by spinning the propeller, just cause. Clamper was the kind of director where it's like, all right, we need to move the plot forward. It doesn't matter if it makes a lot of sense. Let's just do it anyway. It's a cartoon after all. And sure enough, yeah, the propeller spun around and gremlin somehow switches on the plane. But I never realized until now, and yes, you can laugh at me, guys. If it was like, wait a minute, that was pretty obvious. How did you not notice this? But the Gremlin's laugh is patterned after Yankee Doodle. I didn't really notice that before. I don't know why, but anyway. I guess my excuse can be that I'm an Aussie, so there's my excuse. So there you go. When we see Bugs trying to smash through the door, we hear the cue Dark Eyes, which is a Russian folk song. And it's interesting that Clamper would end up using that song cue in his upcoming short Russian Rhapsody, but he would actually add lyrics in there, like, the, you know, with the Gremlin from the Kremlin that kind of thing. So it's interesting that Clamper would end up reusing ideas, but he would actually improve on them. But that whole build-up, though, again, I mentioned this before about his timing in this one, he's really pushing things to the limit. So he's just pushing, pushing, pushing with bugs, just getting ready, getting ready, getting ready. Sort of really, it's like tension in the bow kind of thing, just pulling as far as he can go. And then when finally bugs is ready to go, oh, the door just gets opened. So... It's done for maximum impact. It's absolutely fantastic. This is peak Clampett. And it's not the last thing he would do in this short regarding timing either. And if you've seen this before, and most of you probably have, you'll know the scene I'm talking about. And then we see Bugs slipping through the bananas. How did the Gremlin get so many? Whatever. Again, Clampett would probably say, it's just a cartoon. It's funny. Whatever. We'll just put banana peels. So slipping through. Then we see Bugs' heart saying 4F, and if you're wondering what 4F is, that's a reference to the military, where if you got a 4F, you were not fit for military duty. You might be unfit, or there might be other moral grounds that you can't 
be put in military duty or whatever. One other detail I missed was I like how the gremlin, he's steering the plane, but he can't even see over the dash and Bugs, of course, has to step in. As I mentioned, all throughout the short, Clamper has been experimenting with timing of gags, pushing him to the limit. Here, he takes just about a minute and a half to do the whole plane falling and then you get the punchline at the very end. Now, that's pushing things to the absolute extreme. Yes, Tex Avery did something similar, which allegedly led to his firing and him going over the MGM in an earlier bug show where they thought he was going to kill him off. But here, it's just done so well. And all the animation of bugs looking sickly and the plane just going and going and going. It's like, okay, what's the climax going to be? What's the climax going to be? And at the end, it's like, oh, yeah, we just ran out of gas. And sure enough, if you're wondering what an A card was, there was rationing at the time during World War II when it came to things like gasoline and uh, other items, metal and so on. If you had an A card, though, you were one of the unlucky ones where you can only have so much gasoline. Higher ranked cards would be for things like police officers, that kind of stuff, whereas the regular old Joes would have an A card. So that's what that was. But even if you didn't know about the A card, it's still pretty funny how the plane just stops at the end and see you later. But I think it's more funny if you actually know the reference. But wow, this one is one clamp its best and re-watching it. The more I watch this, the more I absolutely adore it. And I'm sure if I watch it again, I'm going to find something new as well. This one's 10 out of 10. It's a masterpiece, one clamp its best. And I don't like throwing out 10 out of 10s just because, but I think this one definitely merits a 10 out of 10 for me. So... They'll do it for this review. Now you can watch the cartoon and judge for yourself and see if I've missed any other references. So until next time, take care. Hey, I bet that was a... 
Do you think that? Hey, could that have been a gremlin? It ain't Vandal Vilky! <laughs> Where did he go, George? Which way did he go? Mm, that way. Well, gee, thanks a lot, George. Thanks a lot. What's the matter, Bunny Rabbit? Speak to me. Why don't you say something? I'm only three and a half years old. <laughs> Him. He's silly.
with the A card.